Shalom, shalom, Chavarim, shalom. So here, 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 right? This is a subject matter that we've been seeking to get to. And I first of all want to thank my brother, my Ach, um, brother Miguel. Yes, I give thanks for the reason that we had recently and also some other brothers and sisters as well that this topic has come up or a topic related to it. So we call this one right here, um, did Hala Selassie abolish slavery or free the slaves or did he have slaves? Because some seem to be somewhat confused even though their history and our story and the testimony is very clear. There are some who would be saying, oh, well, Hala Selassie had slaves, right? But no longer slaves. Negus Neges, that's Ethiopian for king of kings. Negus Neges, Kanamawi Hala Selassie, the king of kings, Hala Selassie the first, abolished slavery in Ethiopia. Check out Rastafari TV. Yes, sir. And also tune in right here. Rastafari Yehudi, Rastafari Jews right here. I am Ras Ayodonis Tafari Yadin, L-O-J Society, the Lion of Judah Society of His Imperial Majesty. So here, let's um, address this as well as a member in a duly elected office of the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated 2021. Now, did Haile Selassie I, did Emperor Selassie abolish slavery in Ethiopia? Oh, uh, yes, yes, he did. Cain, Cain, Iowa, yes, oh, uh, yes, he did. Now, second part of the question, did he have slaves? No. <laughs> no. In fact, this whole, this whole terminology of slaves is very, very interesting. But people say, well, he had servants. Uh, yeah, but is a servant a slave? Now, if you confound servant with slave, then perhaps in your ignorance you can say such things that are really ignorant and mentally lazy. You know, that's, that's like, maybe you just don't know any better. Maybe sometimes, you know, we all learn. And I'm also learning, continuing every day, you know, we should be growing in grace and the knowledge, right? Especially for us of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. Yes, I, Rastafari. But here, 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 let's address this particular subject matter right here. Did Hala Selassie abolish slavery? Yes, he did. Now, how many of you all have read um, or have a copy of Hiwatena Ethiopia Rimja. The translation of that, My Life in Ethiopia's Progress, or also known as the Autobiography of His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I. Haile Selassie I. How many of you have read that? Book one. It's about book one. Now we have right here, we have book one. We have the Inglesenia Turgum, the English translation. And we also have the Amarinya, the Amharic, the Lasana Negus Neges original right here, here, here as well. Because there's chapter, chapter 14 of the autobiography of Emperor Haile Selassie I, Haile Selassie I, but he used a, you know, that letter I for first right there. And Amharic is Kedamawi, not Kedamawi, but K'e. This chapter, chapter 14, is titled About Our Efforts to Free the Slaves. This is a translation, this is a note that right here, Edward Ullendorf was commissioned by Gormawi Nagus Neges to do the translation. Right? And here we're in Miraf Asara Arat. Baroch neta India wet ua sile madre gachna ye net anatacho wima negara be yametu ye te shashile sile mehedu. Right, now that's the original Amharic of the Lasana Nagusa Neges of the language of the King of Kings, Lasana Nagusa Neges. Right, we have. Um, Zechariah, is it Zechariah? No, Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 3. 
chapter 3 after like verse uh, chapter 3 verse around verse 9 which says you turn to us a pure language that we may call you know upon him one consent from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia yes so here the translation here says about our efforts to free the slaves and the progressive improvement year by year in the struggle for their liberation. This is chapter 14 of the autobiography of Kedemawi Halasalasi here, Mi'raf Asara Arat Baroch Netza Indiwetu Sile Madregachina Ye Netzanatachu Wim Negar Beyametu Yeteshashila Sile Mehedu. Basically, it is a good translation we have here, the Edward Ullendorf. I think he was Sir Edward Ullendorf. He was the one commissioned by Gormawi Nugus Negas to translate book one of my life and Ethiopia's progress. He would Naya Ethiopia Rimja. So here we're at chapter 14. Now the term that is used for let's translate as slaves in them hark is baroch you might hear some ones and ones even some modern ethiopians speak about baria 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 i've heard i have not gone yet in this flesh to witness it myself but i've heard that some brothers and sisters have gone to ethiopia sometimes you know some ethiopians might refer to them as as baria baria you might have heard some baria, and the plural of that is baroch. Now, baria is an interesting, a very, very interesting term because also found in the Metzhaf Kedus, Metzhaf, the book Kedus, holy, or in the holy scriptures. So here's where we have to now zoom in on this terminology of slave or Slav, because in the beginning, in the beginning was the word. Right? In the beginning, it's the word. What is the word? Right? In the beginning was the word. Now, of course, that's more in a religious sense, but looking at this now in the principle, right? it's not about so-called preaching religion or whatnot, but this is about using what our divine heritage teaches us in a principle way right? that can inform those who are of our shared faith and even others who are not of the truth. Right? Bariya. Baria in the scripts, Israel, right? Yisrael is called in them hard scriptures, Ye Egziavihir Baria, Dawit, Negus Dawit, Dawid, Hamelech, King David in the Amharic scripture is referred to as Ye Egziavihir Baria, Ye Egziavihir Baria. Abed Yahuwah, Abed, 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 Abed. It's like in the Arabic and also in the Hebrew we have Abed, Abed, right? Or Obed, like in Obadiah. Obadiah. What does Obadiah, the name Obadiah mean? The name Obadiah, if you look in the basic, um, what they call it, concordance or Bible dictionary, the name Obadiah of the prophet Obadiah, right? Abdiyu. The name means the servant of Yah, or as I now would say, the servant of Jah, Rastafari, of Jah, of Yah, right? Obediyah, Obadiah, 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 right? Obadiyah, 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 Obadiyah means the servant. The servant of Yah, the servant of He who be, He who exists, of Yah, Yah, Jah, the Savior name of Yisrael. So, servant or slave. You see, where the confusion comes in amongst many ones and ones is based on not understanding the word. Right? The word, the word that we use. And the words that are used to, to confuse. So when we're speaking about for example, Negus Neges, the King of Kings, Kedemawi Hala Selassie, abolishing slavery in Ethiopia, we are speaking in a strictly kind of a modernistic sense, right? But now, when we speak of the true context, it's about 
servant and what kind of servant? They are servants, right? And then there's another term that's used, at least in the 1611 translation, because this takes us back through this 400 years. We have to recognize that 400 years has changed many things, right? Confused many things. The context and the paradigm of many things have been changed. So when we're looking on ancient times, many of us as so-called, you know, black and brown peoples over here, we're looking through the spectacles of the, the broken spectacles of the 400 year experience. So sometimes we're projecting so-called modernistic or latter day times of the Gentile, so-called white supremacy, confusion, Babylonian confusion ideas on ancient times. It's like some people say, you hear some people say, oh, the Bible condones slavery. While the word Bible, the, I mean the word slavery, the word slavery does not even appear in the 400 year Bible. Did you know that? The word slavery. And even the two places that in the translation of the KJV 400 year Bible, I keep emphasizing the KJV 400 year Bible because that was, that we can say was the version, whether the AV or the RV, the authorized version or the revised version that was utilized by the Western Gentile world, right, over the past 400 years. That's basically the version of the Bible that built this Western Gentile, this global Anglo-American world order, world system, empire, right? Whether one say white supremacy or biblically the times of the Gentiles. And as how to make a slave, right? The, the Wooly Lynch paper. I'm paraphrasing right here, don't have a copy in front of me, but from what we recall from the Wooly Lynch, How to Make a Slave paper, they said to take away from the enslaved, right? Because we were not Slavs or slaves, but we were enslaved, right? We, the Bayit Yisrael, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, we were enslaved. Take away from us, right, our native our own language, take away from us our own language to forbid it and take away our own language and to make sure that the new language that we would be programmed by, that we would not have a good understanding, a good understanding of the new language. So take away from us our like mother tongue, right? And to make sure that we don't understand this new language, we only would be able to understand what we need to continue in their predetermined enslavement, in their enslavement scheme and the enslavement conspiracy. And I think they use an example in the Willie Lynch letter, How to Make a Slave paper. They use an example um, like if Massa, if Massa, master so-called, the white so-called slave master, if he said, boy, get our crops, right? That when master say our crops, make sure that the so-called enslaved Hebrew and Israelite, the enslaved black man, right, does not think it means our, that our crops doesn't mean our crops, but our crops mean our crops, not his crops, not their crops, because otherwise we will have a problem is what Willie Lynch and, and, and whoever, whosoever, you know, wrote and those ideas, right, that strategy. So that there I'll point out right here because of the importance of language and what we get from the biblical principle. We're not talking about religion or denomination because L-O-J, line of Judah, we're non-denominational. Rastafari Israelite, we're non-denomination, just to make that very, very clear, right? But the principle of it, the beginning is the word. And even in the Willie Lynch letter, How to Make a Slave, right, paper, the 400-year document, you know, give or take, right, it basically pointed that out, that language and linguistics to remove from our people our language. And in this new language, to make sure that we would always have a faulty, right, a lacking, 
a lacking and a faulty understanding, a misunderstanding of this new language, that we would not look at the language like the example of our crops. When Master said our crops, he really meant his and his boys, his, his enslavers, right? so-called white supremacists. It did not mean like our crops, like what well, we did the work, you know, in the land. So therefore, our crops, these are our crops. No, no, no. These are his crops. The our mean his. The our don't mean ours, like our crops, right? So therefore, let's touch on this word Slav and slavery. Because the term in the Amharic, even from the title of chapter 14 of the autobiography of Emperor Haile Selassie, um, book one, Chapter 14, which says about our efforts to free the slaves, about our efforts to free the slaves and the progressive improvement year by year in the struggle for their liberation. Here, once again, Baroch slaves, or rather servants, slaves, right? And I say servants, the original idea was servant. That's the same word used in the Amharic Holy Scriptures, right? Corresponding with servant of the Lord. That's why we use the name Obadiah as an example. Obed come from Abed, 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 right? Obed, Obediah, Obediah, Obadiah, right? Obadiah. So does that mean slave of Jah? Does that mean slave of God? Does the does name Obadiah mean slave of God? When David says, I am thy servant, did he really mean I am thy slave? Is there not any difference? Do you not have any understanding? You know what understanding is? And I go to the Hebrew on this right here. The word for understanding in Hebrew is bina, is bina. And the word for like between is bain, 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 bain. And what it really means is the ability to distinguish between this and that. So somebody who has understanding has the ability to distinguish between this and that. Like I said, somebody, don't you understand that slave is different than servant? And they're telling me that, well, slave and servant is all the same thing. So let me ask you a question. Are you an employee or are you an employer? Majority of people probably are employees. So are you a slave? No, no, no. I mean, are you really, really a slave? And if you're a black person, especially in these here Americas, are you a slave like your and my, I and I ancestors were slaves? Are you that kind of slave? See, now we may say that we feel like, oh, I'm going to the plantation. Well, at least on the plantation that you may be going to nowadays, basically going to your job and your work as an employee, right? You can choose to, to quit the job you probably can go and find another job. Maybe it'll be difficult. Maybe it'll be easy. Maybe you can make your own work, you know, for yourself, right? And also while you work that job as an employee, though you might feel like a slave because you want to have your own business or whatever else like that, you know, and you don't like your boss or you don't like the hours or whatever, all those feelings and emotions and, you know, could be mixed up moods and attitudes, but you should not, as I told many of my brothers and sisters that I used to say that too. Yeah, I'm going to the slave. But then I stopped. I stopped quickly because I was like, wait, wait, hold on for a moment. Why am I insulting my ancestors? If I'm going and I'm working at a job, right, some employment, right, and I am an employee and I work for an employer, I went on an interview. So many times I negotiated the salary that I was going to get paid, Right. Sometimes I even negotiated, you know, to get a little raise, you know, to say, well, my work is this. I brought this much benefit to the business, even more money to the business. So, you know, and he thinks it's difficult. I got, you know, white family, you know, I got dependents. And therefore, therefore, I need to make a little more money. Could could a enslaved and Slav black person, one of our people over here. Somebody said, why don't you just call them African? I call them Ethiopians because it's trans Ethiopian Ocean. But our enslaved people over here, they could not negotiate right, a better salary. Uh, by the way, what sort of salary did the so called black or Negro slaves here in the Americas and the Caribbean, what sort of salary did they have? 
I mean, could they negotiate this? Could, could, could they quit their job? Could they, could they quit this plantation? Say, Masa, I quit your plantation. I'm going over to so-and-so, Boss Hogg's plantation, because he going to pay me better. All, all that is, is, is silly, right? Because none of that was the reality of the time. That's, that, maybe it's a joke business. You could joke a little bit. But then these are our ancestors, Right? And we're talking about our own ancestors, right? We should have regard for our own ancestors. No, they may not have been perfect, they may not have always been right, but they were our ancestors and they did experience a very dehumanizing. Remember, it was chattel slavery. See, even chattel slavery in the West, in the Americas, in the Caribbean is much different than any other form of what they want to call slavery because nowadays the white man and a lot of their um, mouthpieces they would like to say today intellectually they probably graduated got a degree whatever 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 and they would basically say well there was slavery all over the world everybody was slave at one time big people the slavery black people had slaves and everybody had slaves but see what they did is they moved the goalposts they moved the goalposts we're going to prove to you that they moved the goalposts the first thing we wanted to point out right here, based on the subject, is that Haile Selassie the first abolished slavery, right? And the really what it was is the slave trade. In fact, in the Amharic, it's called Fandia. 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 Fandia is a slave trade. There were many outside um, peoples, peoples who were not peoples of the king of kings of Ethiopia or of the Judeo the Judaic Solomonic dynasty, right, of the King of Kings, descended, you know, from Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, from that, who were stealing people, right, who were stealing people, right, and selling them to other peoples outside of the, the kingdom, the dominion of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, outside the dominion of that Judeo-Christian, we could say, empire, in the Horn of Africa in East, what's called East Africa, i.e. Ethiopia. Let me give you an example right here. We'll need to touch on slave. What is the etymology of slave? What is the difference between slave and servant? Another question is, were there slaves in the Bible? Well, Actually, the two places in the Bible where we find the term slave or slaves, both of them are in error. The one place we find in Isaiah, if you look in the Bible, is in italics. If you study the Hebrew and the original language, that's not there. The italicizations in the KJV Bibles are words that were added Right, by the translator to give the English reader a sense of what the Hebrew or the interpretation of the Hebrew or the New Testament Koine Coptic Greek was. In the New Testament in Revelation, we find the word slave, and when you look into the 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 Koine Greek, the underlying word is soul. <laughs> Where it says, you know, it's actually soul. It's actually so, right? If we have enough time here, we'll go over it again. Some of y'all might recall the earlier um, video and teaching and tutoring that we did on that particular subject matter, going into the word and showing, showing and proving. But first of all, concerning the abolishment of slavery and the slave trade. Here, his imperial majesty says here in chapter 14, it had been customary in the past in Ethiopia, a part of Africa, just as it had been in Asia, Europe, and America, to sell and to buy slaves. All right now, remember the term we're reading English here. Right, we're reading English here. What does it say right here? The Kedmozem and Baria, or Baria. Meshetna Megzat, Be Isiana, Be Europa, Be America, Telemdo, Yemia Nor, Sle Nebre, Be Africa, Kuffel, Be Ethiopia, Telemdo, Yenor, Neber. So basically the word here is Baria, 
Baria. Baria means a servant. Now, of course, the translator here, Edward Ullendorf, he uses the conventional term, and we understand why he uses the conventional term. But like we said, the goalposts had been moved over the past 400 years. And we're going to prove it, hopefully, in this vlog right here. So stay tuned. But he goes on saying, Nevertheless, the number of those who arrived by way of sale and purchase was small. For the majority of slaves or servants came through capture in war. The reason is that in Ethiopia, from the 15th, to the 18th century. Let's take note right here. Now, here there's a footnote that Edward Ullendorf, the translator of Gormawi Negus autobiography says, I think the 16th to the 19th centuries are in fact referred to here. So his majesty speaks about the 15th to the 18th century, but the translator says he thinks the 16th to the 19th centuries are in fact referred to here. He goes on to say that the power of Muslims and pagans had prevailed against her. Again, the reason, the reason for the majority of servants, right, some of them becoming bond servant. A bond servant is more closer to what we would call today a slave. A bond servant came through capture in war. The reason is that in Ethiopia, from the 15th to the 18th century, the power of Muslims and pagans had prevailed against her. Gradually and little by little, while many of her provinces rebelled against the reign of the emperor, against the reign of the king of kings, establishing their own nobility and looting the country. But later on, the kings before us, and in particular Emperor Menelik, conquered these provinces in battle, in battle to restore them as of old to the unity of Ethiopia. And as for all those who had come by way of capture and war, it had been the custom that they should live in slavery to their captor in accordance with ancient usage. Now, Remember, we're using the word slave here by the translator, but we're going to put all this in context. Let's hear this a little more. Nevertheless, those who had come as prisoners of war were scarcely distinguishable in appearance, except for a few from other Ethiopians. Again, again, we got to repeat this. Nevertheless, those who had come as prisoners of war were scarcely distinguishable in appearance except for a few from other Ethiopians, and therefore it is very difficult to identify them as slaves. Thus, the slavery of some was in name only, and the servitude of some was in name only. But in their mode of living, they were not much different from their captors. In other words, recall that what our people, the lost found sheep of the house of Israel, the Bait Yisrael, in the Americas and the Caribbean, they were under what is called chattel slavery. Chattel slavery is that human beings were treated as animals. And no matter how much refinement, learning the white man's ways and doing things according to his society, they still was looked down on as not even being human beings. That is 180 degree opposite of the majority of areas around the world where one group of people fought another group of people. The people who lost had to serve the, you know, like say uncle, say uncle, had to serve the, the victor. That's why his majesty said their mode of living were not much different from their captives. They were able to purchase and sell wrist. Rist in Amharic is hereditary land ownership, or like other people, to have rist, rist, hereditary land ownership rights established by the government to attain offices or ministerial rank in government service or in the service of the church, the rank of diacon, deacon, 
ace or kahin, priest, monk, or priorship of a monastic order or the deanship of a cathedral. Now, we're going to pause, right? We're going to pause right here, right? Let's just take a little bit more of this right here before we pause. Right? The Memphis Cadu says, go on. As they were indistinguishable in appearance, you, you, you see the emphasis here, as they were indistinguishable in appearance. It's like one black tribe, and we have this even in ancient Egypt, right, or in ancient, ancient, the ancient world, right? One tribe fight the next tribe. Sometimes they were distant and related family members. And the next one lost the battle. Therefore, the loser had to serve the victor. After a while, the loser rose up in rank among the people who had defeated them in war and even can become the ruler of the people who had defeated them. This was not the case over here for we, the black people of the world in the Americas and the Caribbean because of slavery. See, what his majesty is speaking of is servitude, even bond servitude in the ancient world and the ancient Ethiopian world, 180 degree opposite. Like he says, as they were indistinguishable in appearance and mode of life. Were black people indistinguishable over here in appearance and mode of life from their so-called white captors? No. So again, his majesty says, as they were indistinguishable in appearance and mode of life, they could even be married, get this, to their captor or his son or his relations. When the captor died, he might leave them wrist. Rist, again, in the Amharic, Rist is hereditary land ownership and money in his will, having treated them like his children. Again, as, it, as is the practice all over the world, there are many people in each province who are doing a day's work, being taken in service for a wage. That's a wage earner. That's what we call today an employee. Yet, while the Italians, the, it, the Italians or the fascists, the, the Romanists, while the Italians knew all this, they spread it about that there were slaves, that there were slaves rather than workers employed for a wage in some rich man's house. They spread these rumors, exaggerating to the point of perjury. Again, His Majesty, the King of Kings, says that the Italians, the Romanists, had spread these rumors, exaggerating them to the point of perjury. So let's, let's pause right there. We read one, two, three paragraphs from chapter 14 of His Imperial Majesty's autobiography. Chapter 14, Book 1, about our efforts to free the slaves and the progressive improvement year by year in the struggle for their liberation. And in these three paragraphs, especially this last paragraph, it really brings home our main point. That there were those who were doing a day's work being taken in service for a wage. Black people in the Americas and the Caribbean, our ancestors over the past 400 years, their wages, you know, right, was to serve, do whatever, you know, the, the slave massa, right, said to do, or the wage was death, right? Yet, while the Romanists, the fascists, or as Massey called them, the Italians, knew all this, they spread it about that they were slaves. So here's Massey hit it right on the bullseye right here, proverbally speaking, that they spread about this lie that they were slaves. And this is the same thing they have sought to do and many seek to do with his Massey. Oh, his Massey had slaves. His Massey had slaves. He didn't abolish slavery. He had slaves. I mean, even sadly, Marcus Garvey, while he was losing his head like John the Baptist later on after he served his first purpose, his main goal to be that voice of one crying in the wilderness to prepare, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. Right. Instead, they spread these rumors 
right? That the people were slaves or enslaved rather than that they were workers employed for a wage in some rich man's house. This is the same thing that happens here in America. Some of us, because, you know, for whatever reason, whatever job that we're working, you know, we'd be like, I'm going to the plantation. I'm, yeah, I'm heading back to the plantation. But think about it when you say this. It, it, it sounds nice or it sounds whatever way it sounds. It is nice. Nice means ignorant. But it sounds, you know, you, you say it. You might feel a way about saying it, but think about it for a moment. You are comparing what you are going through with what your ancestors, our ancestors was going through, yet you can quit anytime you want to. Some people say, I can't quit because I got bills to pay. No, no, no. See, you're lying to yourself. You can quit. You probably can make your own work for yourself, but you don't believe that. You don't have faith that you can do that, or maybe you don't think that you can do that. So therefore, you're only a slave in your own mentality. You're not like our people, right, who were forced by the whipped, by, by physical, psychological, spiritual violence into this condition and was not employed for a wage, did not receive wages, could not change your employment, right? You, you, you couldn't go to another plantation. So it's an insult to our ancestors, especially to us, we the black peoples of the world, especially over here in these here Americas and the Caribbean, when we are an employee, right? Now imagine this, suppose you're not an employee, but you're an employer, and say you have a small business. You like to pay your employees more money, but the business only makes a X amount of money, so you have to do the best that you can do with what you can do, right? And then think, and you may be hiring fellow black people, and then the black people treating you like you a slave master because of your generosity and willingness to employ them for their work and to pay them the best wage that you can, and now they're treating you like you're the cracker, the peckerwood, the slave master, can you imagine, you know, and we talk about, you know, why we as black people need to come together and need to, well, the first thing we have to do is come together around truth, right? Around truth and what is true, right? So we use this terminology too loosely nowadays when we are in like 180 degree opposite reality, right? Opposite reality. You know, we can move about. If we will, if we have some funds or whatever, we can travel, you know, so far still more or less, you know, there's a lot of these different things of the pandemic and the pandemic and all this, you know, but we still can move about. We can do things. We can buy things. We can own things. We can employ people, so forth and so on. You know what I mean? So it's not the same thing, right? It's not the same thing. <sighs> So His Majesty right here just basically touches on the point, one of the main points that we sought to bring forward, right? We can go to the biblical level, but right now we'd like to get to the etymological level, right? Etymological level, right, right here. And, um, okay, let's bring this up right here for a moment before we get to that right there, the etymology. Now, you can see here I looked up the word rigor, Rigor, right? Rigor, R-I-G-O-U-R. Now that's the that's the English, old English way, the O-U-R instead of just O-R. But you know that's how what you gotta know. You gotta know those little, you know, got got to have that understanding so you can, you know, when you're searching these things out, you can find them. Here in Exodus chapter one verse thirteen, it says, "And the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians, or some of y'all might prefer the Kemetians, right? The Kemetics, right? But the Mizraim, the Mitzrayim made the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel, to serve. So you're talking about service. An employee is basically a servant. We use this fancy word, employee, but basically it's a servant, right? It says that the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel, right? The Egyptians made the sons of Israel to serve with rigor, with rigor, right? Now, that right there could be understood or even construed in some sense to be similar, right, to, but not the same, not exactly the same as what black people went through. Because even the children of Israel in ancient um, Egypt, 
right, still were regarded as human beings. Now, of course, the Egyptians had their ideas because there was a difference of spirituality and religion in some ways, so forth and so on. Then the Mitzrayim, then the Kemetics, right? But that word rigor is like you are serving, but you're serving a, a, a bad master, a bad employer. Right, you know what I mean. You're serving a, a employer that is putting rigor, or right here, the word is perek. Now, what's interesting about the word perek? The other form of it is farek. This is where the farek. This is where Africa, the name Africa, comes from. Let me let that pause on you for a moment. Somebody pick it up, do a meme on it, you know, work it out. Right? We can work it out a little bit more, but we just we just put that one out there. Perek, perek. Aperek, apereka, right? Africa, Africa, apereka, perek. Perek means harshness, severity, cruelty. So when some people were captured in war, sometimes their captors caused them to serve with harshness, with severity, with with cruelty. The, the meaning or the root of perek, ferek, perek, is to break apart. You know, like where you're, you're working and you're working so hard, it's almost like you're falling apart. Your health is falling apart. But, but you can't stop because somebody got the whip on you. Somebody got the lash on you. Physically, psychologically, or spiritually upon you. Going down right here to the Strong's definition, you can see where the root is to break. The idea is to break apart, to fracture. This is why we say the word perek is where the Hebrew root for the modern Africa, right? Africa, called perek, one form of it, pointed as perek, right? The next form of it as ferek, because in the Hebrew, the pe, fe, perek, ferek, paro, faro, paro, faro, right? So the next is fracture. This is why you see with the Berlin Conference where they, they um, sealed up the new name for the continent called previously Ethiopia for Africa because they carved it up, they fractured it. They drew these artificial boundaries and borders, right, according to those Gentile European nations. That is severity, cruelty, and you see the last word, rigor. Now, the words that are in italics here, when you read in the Strong's definition, the words that are in italics is bringing out the root meaning. The words that are not italics help to support and give a context. So there's other words for break, but this idea of perek, ferek, is to break apart, to fracture. That is severity. So sometimes in the translation, after the colon and the hyphen, you will find in some places in the KJV Bible, they were translated as cruelty or rigor. Let's go right here for a moment, right? So even this, once we say, Yadin, does this mean that the, the Egyptians put the Israelites in slavery? In one context, I think it's a, a miscontextualization, you could say that. But the difference between even servitude with rigor, which is more like a bond servant, right, in that sense, or, or harsh servitude, right, a harsh form of servitude, right, like sometimes you work, sometimes you get a paycheck, sometimes you get a slap and a beat, right, but then you come back and then they say, I'll pay you, and then they, they, they pay you, but they beat you, you know, and all that kind of confusion, but still, there is some sort of now i'm not saying that in ancient egypt they receive wages let me just say that right here because you know in that sense wages in fact the wages is almost there are some things very similar because you remember even this gentile babylon american anglo-american british american society that basically runs the world system of today the latter day times of the gentiles they even love to use the pyramid on their dollar bill and love in their Masonic, their Freemasonry to use all this Egyptology. So there's something spiritual that's going on right there. 
spiritual wickedness in high places no doubt let's go down here to the hebrew right here here in the hebrew is waya ebidu waya ebidu mitzrayim waya ebidu mitzrayim and they serve the the or cause to serve the the mitzrayim the egyptians cause to serve et bnei yisrael be farek now what's interesting here the word is farek here they point it as a p so that word perek is farek farek right when we do the um the dikduk like the the grammar of it and the binyanin and the construction to make a causative sense a farek a fareka a fareka right it's almost like to say in a sense that either you cause right you cause the fracture to break or in another sense it could be brought out as i cause the fracture to break but here is bi farek so here the word that's highlighted there is in harshness in cruelty in severity once again the word farek is the hebrew right the hebrew root of the latter day term for the continent of ethiopia called africa africa right africa right so we have fareka fareka afareka afraka afraka right but here we have bi farek the fuller sentence right here waya abidu waya abidu mitraim et bene israela bi farek right and the Egyptians ruthlessly made the children of Israel labor, made the children of Israel serve, and bringing it down right here, that first word, Waya Abidu, Waya Abidu, Waya Abidu, Waya Abidu, modern Hebrew, Waya Abidu, ancient pointing, Waya Ya Abidu, Waya Abidu, right? That's the H5647, you see the word Abad. Abad, Abad, right? It's Ein. Basically, the word means to work, to serve. And it's not a bad word. In fact, the children of Israel are called by Yahweh, hey, where he says that ye, y'all are my servants. Y'all are my servants. In fact, the sacred liturgy, Hebraically and Judaically, we call it the Aboda. The Aboda, or in modern Hebrew, the Avoda. The avoda is like the service, and it comes from abad, abad, avoda, right? It's the work, the service, like the sacred liturgy. You know, we go through our prayers and our order of worship. That's what that's called, the service, right? The work, the serve. So it's not a bad word, right? It's not a bad word, but it's how. See, the question is how. How do you serve? Or how are you made to serve? right how do you work how are you made to work and if you're in a condition where you are working don't receive any wages right you don't get any wages you get a little shed a, a little shed you know to dwell in you get the slop like the hog mog or whatever else like that whatever whatever people throw away and you have to make the best of it like our people you know had to do right over those past 400 years Right? You couldn't quit you couldn't quit your job, right? You couldn't quit your enslavement. You couldn't go to another plantation. You couldn't negotiate your wages. And on top of all of that, you was considered to be an animal. You was not even considered to be a human being. That's what they call chattel slavery. Remember what his majesty says in chapter 14? He says in, in the Ethiopia context. Many of the servants were indistinguishable in appearance in their mode of life from the people who had maybe originally fought their people and brought their people underneath the dominion of the King of Kings or of the Judeo-Christian, we could say, government and rulership, our own Israelite kingdom, my that hidden empire 
that we had, right, in Africa, right, or in Ethiopia, right, East Africa, if you please. But you go down right here, look what it said right here, to serve God. To serve God. To serve with Levitical service, what we just mentioned, the Levitical, the priestly service, right? To work for another, to serve another by labor, to serve as subjects, to serve Elohim, Hailehim, Exabia, to serve with Levitical service. And the Nephi, the different senses of the word, the Nephi sense, to be worked, to be tilled like land, right? Land being worked or tilled, to make oneself a servant, right? To something that is worked, right? To compel, to labor or work, to cause to labor, to cause to serve, to cause to serve as subjects, right? The, the whole foul sense is to be led or enticed to serve, but getting to the very root right here, according to Strong's, right, is to work in any sense. So the Hebrew sense right here is to work. Now, of course, it's how you work. You can work for somebody who's just, who's right. Yes, they want you to do the whatever work. Like if you work for me, you're my employees and you have to do a certain type of job. That's your job. I would want you to do that job. Now, if I treat you as though you are an animal, you're not even a human being, you can't talk back to me, I'll whip you, i slap you, i beat you, I don't pay you no salary, I don't pay you nothing, i have you living in the shed, whatever food that I don't eat, the refuge of food, I make you eat that, that is a totally 180 degree different something. See, as we said earlier, the Gentile, they play this thing called grimoire, grimoire or grandma. Grimoire is a particular type of, of kind of a, like a magical kind of scroll they use, right, in certain types of occultism. But it's very much related to grammar. It's word games. They play word games, right, word games. So now we don't hear about like servitude as it was in the ancient world where one tribe fight another tribe and the tribe that loses right has to cry uncle and basically serve the next tribe but after a while the people right become one people and even the people who had come in as servants or captors or the 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 losers of whatever war that occurred they now even become the ruling, the leading people as his imperial majesty even states. And this is historical facts from the Ethiopians' own manuscripts and testimony and even from the testimony of other peoples. Right? Remember even how the, I think the Prophet Muhammad, he even mentioned about the Ethiopians, at least of the ancient times, was one of the most honest and trustworthy of peoples. Not saying that everybody was, but overall they, they valued their word, they valued their faith, they valued what they believed in, right? And if they believe in the true God and the God of Israel, right, then the way they did it was biblical. Right. And see, and I know I say that I probably threw a couple of people because people say that the Bible, there's this false meme the Gentiles have running around talking about the Bible condones slavery. Yet I say that's a lie. Their white man's interpretation, the, the slave master's interpretation of the Bible condones slavery. So much so that the word slave barely appears two times in the whole Bible in the translation Right? It's not there in the original, but in the translation, but yet they would change the word for servant, right? And even bond servant, right? Because bond means that you're in bond, you know, like you're in, you're, you know, you're, you're captured. So you had two kinds of services, right? You see what it says down here, it says work in any sense by implication to serve, to till. In a coercive sense, they put in their own word in Slav. Right? Be kept in bondage, be a bondman, bond servants. That means that one tribe for the next tribe, capture them, right, beat them, right, didn't kill them after they lost the battle and said, All right now, you know how it goes. We beat you. Y'all maybe beat us, y'all beat our parents in the previous generation. We had to serve you. Right? And now we beat you, you serve us. Maybe they didn't want to serve. 
You know, you know what I mean? So maybe there was some harshness and rigor so forth and so on. But still, yet and still in Africa and Asia, they still, by and large, there's only some rare examples where they did not look on the servants as human beings. And one of those places was in the caste system in India. And that had a lot to do based on the information that I get to find with white men, with white people upsetting the ancient Dravidian civilization of India and creating this kind of like light skin, dark skin, or this kind of, um, you know, if you're closer to white, almost like when you look at the system in ancient India, right? What happened to the Dravid uh, Dravidians, the Hindus Kush, Kush, Ethiopia, the Hindus Kush people, right? And those conquerors that had come from the north who were called blonde hair and blue eyed, big burly, kind of like giants, like Goliath type giants that came in and created this, this apartheid system in the ancient time. It's interesting because you can, you can always know people by the psychological fingerprint because we find this in the ancient India, right? And then we find our Hindia or Hudu we call it a hoodoo, hoodoo, Hindu, Hindu is hoodoo in the Hebrew, right? We find it in ancient India, right? Because of these, these white peoples that came, I call them Canaanites, but these white peoples who came from the north and had upset, the, had took over, had beat and defeated the system and then flipped the whole system that the dark-skinned people, you know, the untouchables and all of that, if a dark-skinned person or a melanated person casts their shadow on a, on a light-skinned, a white-skinned person, then that white-skinned person was, was ritually and spiritually somehow unclean. All this kind of spookism. But then we come to the modern, the latter-day times where the Anglo-American, predominantly white people are ruling the world system, at least ruling more than three-fourths of the earthly plane and we see the same thing the very same thing has occurred in south africa over here in the americas right and even enforcing elsewhere so bad that now people are even people who never did it to their own people are doing it to their own people like you hear about black people have this colorism thing going on you see you know what i mean um evil finding a willing servant right the the um the um what's that old saying that they say um the um almost like the victim becoming a, a victimizer in that sense but go down the word a little bit more husband man husband man that's somebody who who tends to like a farm or something like that keep laboring bring to pass now here's all the different senses you see the last one there where it says worshiper that's interesting because the word for servant in the Hebrew also has a sense or even a connotation, right, by the context in the scripts of a worshiper. So one who serves Yah, Yahweh, Hakadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, blessed be the name, right, is a worshiper, the one that truly serves. We say El Elohe, Elohe Yisrael, the Elohim of Yisrael is also, according to the context of the scripture, a servant, right? And a worshiper. So here, 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 we bring out this sense here, the rigor. See, even here is repeated in the next verse. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. But the word bondage is aboda. You see that word aboda? That's what I was talking about. Aboda is labor with hard labor, harsh labor. Notice what it said, labor of servant or slave. So even right here, they show this distinguishment right here, servant or slave. Servant or slave. Captives or subjects. See, th this is where we get good understanding. People talk about overstanding, overstanding. Listen, you don't overstand nothing until you get a standing. See, because you can't overstand something. You can't over the standing if you don't have a good standing it's like in court they say some people don't have standing in court standing you need to have standing so the basic standing is understanding what these words really mean 
getting a basic understanding of what these words would mean. You see how in one sense is service of God, right? So now, not to get into all the details of the ancient Egyptian, you know, um, bondage of the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel, but not only do we have to work for them, but we also had to um, work for their gods. Though we didn't acknowledge their gods and our gods or their ancestors, our ancestors, they wanted us to... So it, it was like what happened with the white man over here, right? They give us Kaiser, Kaiser Borgia, right? Kaiser Borgias, right? Kazar Borgias, Caesar Borgias. And they say, oh, this is Jesus. You know, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only do they take our own book, flip it on us, right? Whitewash the images, you know what I mean? But now made us to serve not only them, but their, their counterfeit religion, their counterfeit God, their false God, their false religion. In that sense, it is similar to what happened in the period that leads up to the Exodus. That was not the experience of the Israelites in all their sojourn in Egypt. Let's note that right there. Their experience in Egypt went from better to worse. Let's just point it out. Went from better to worse. Because, you know, like over here, before they had Trump, right, as the president, right? Now they have forbidden, I mean, for Biden, Biden, right? Bidden, bidden, right? They have bidden Biden, right? And as things got better or things worse, you know, under some rulers or governments it can be very good for the people when that government goes out and there's another rulers come in it can be bad for groups of people like you know for some of us under like people like kennedy they say kennedy was a wonderful president some say that right and he was seeking to do this and do that and the next thing and then we get after him you know it comes down to ones like um reagan and then bush you know and then all of this other stuff that by comparison is going from that which was a little bit better to that which is much worse. I mean, just look at the value of the dollar bill, what ones could get for a dollar bill by right, 50 or 100 years ago and what ones can get for a dollar bill today. So I'm pointing that out to say this is what was occurring in ancient Mitzrayim. In ancient Mitzrayim, when our people, the Bnei Yisrael, came in during the time of Yawasaf, Ayusef, Yosef, Joseph, or Tzafnat Pa'anki, Pa'anki. So the Paneach, properly pronounced in the Hebrew, is Ank. Tzafnat Pa'anki, Pa'ank. This is, this is, so even that right there is kind of found. Isn't that interesting? Right? See what happens when people miss when they don't really diligently study and study with the Habarim? Right? But let's just go on right here. So we see it here. Right? And look what it says in Leviticus 25, 43. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor. Check. We are to rule even when we're in a position to have authority, responsibility over our brethren, but not with rigor. What's that word rigor? Perek. Ferek. Like Africa. Right? Ferek, perek, the root. But thou shalt fear reverence, Eloheka, the I Elohim. Thou shalt respect. And what does that mean? That means that when he says we're not to rule over, let's go right here just to get a context of this right here. Right? It says, for they are, you see what it says? For they are my servants. Do you see slaves there? Do you see slaves there? For they are my servants. Because we say the Bible condones slavery. No, it doesn't. The white man lied to you, especially the, the historical white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, because they were the whole Bible, Bible, Bible people that were so-called reading and understanding the Bible because they didn't want to be under the Pope. They were the same ones that said that they would not be no slave to their, their brothers and sisters in, in Britain and England, the same ones who sent them over here for charter to take and steal other people's land and people would give thanksgiving for it, you know, all that crazy stuff. For they are my servants, Josh said, who I brought forth out of the land of Mitzrayim, they shall not be sold as bondmen. Did you check that right there? They shall not be sold, right? They shall not be sold, right? Here we have Mimkaret, Mimkaret. They shall not be sold 
as Ebed. They should not be sold as bondmen. Are, are you following the reasoning here? And see, I point this out and I connect it with the subject matter here concerning Hala Selassie, concerning that Ethiopian Hebrew Judeo-Christian root, right? The Royal Order of the Ethiopian Hebrews after the Order of Melchizedek, because from our study of historical Ethiopia, as far as the manuscripts can record, nearly 3,000 years ago, all the way to 1974-75, this is what was practiced, this biblical my, this biblical moray. In other words, like his master says, as they were indistinguishable in the parents and mode of life, those who were servants, they could even be married to their captor or his son or relations. And when their captor, the one who, like in the first generation, I fight your people, I beat your people, now I bring your children over here or the captors over here, they work for me, they are part of our society, but after a while they become indistinguishable from us and they can rise up in our order. This is what the black people thought they could do with white people. You know, when we start to, you know, dress up like them, speak like them, try to understand their society. We thought because something in our genes understood that where this had happened before, where one people had captured another people, they eventually was able to like assimilate and move up into that society, you know, over time. But that was not so with chattel slavery. Not slavery, chattel slavery. Say it correctly. Chattel slavery. That was not the case. And that is why this 400 year is biblical prophecy. Right? And this is why this so-called enslavement slavery is different than captives, prisoners of war, almost anywhere else in the world and in human history. Because this is biblical prophecy concerning the once lost now found Bait Yisrael, the house of Israel. Right? And, and then, you know, when his majesty says, as the practice all over the world, there are many people in each province, like each area, who are doing a day's work being taken in service for a wage. That's what we always get them. Because our ancestors, right, the black people, we identify them as the Israelites, Right? The Judahites, we the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, our people over here, they were not receiving no wage. Their wages was death if they didn't do what Massa said. Right? But the Italians, the Romanists, the fascists during the time of his mass, they, they knew all this. They spread it about that there were slaves in Ethiopia. So y'all, people nowadays, continuing the rhetoric, don't even know that they are just sock puppet mouths for so-called white supremacy, speaking against his divine majesty, Kadamawi Hada Selassie, and the royal order of the Ethiopian Hebrews. As the majesty, they spread it about that they were slaves rather than workers employed for a wage in some rich man's house. They spread these rumors, exaggerating to the point of perjury. Interesting, his master says perjury. Because what is perjury? Perjury is lying in court. And when they say that his majesty had slaves and he had slaves, even if it's Marcus Garvey in his, in his as John the Baptist says, that he must increase, I must decrease. That Hala Selassie had to increase, Marcus Garvey had to decrease. Right? We give thanks to John the Baptist for being the voice crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way. And we give thanks for him fulfilling that part of prophecy, being that voice. But we come to the Christ, even the black Christ, even to the King of Kings. But they perjure. They perjure, right? Lying in court. That's why it says, thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but thou shalt respect thy power. Right, thy power, thy true good, thy true God. One more verse, or really two more verses here. Right here, here, here. Leviticus 25, 46. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. Now this is speaking about other peoples. Peoples who are not in covenant 
with the Elohim of Yisrael. But over your brethren, those who are in covenant with the Hailehim, the Elohim of Yisrael, the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel, ye, y'all shall not rule one over another with rigor. That's the same word, perek, ferek, right? As they ruled Africa, right? As the white man, the, the Gentiles, the Berlin Conference, all of that, like they did with black people, with rigor. And not only did they rule black people with rigor, the whips, the chains, the lashes, the lynching, all of the castration, the ripping the bellies. Not only did they rule over them with rigor, but they deemed black human beings, human beings, the children, our black people, they, the so-called Negro, they deemed them as what? As chattel. That means cattle. Last verse right here. Leviticus 25, 53. And as a yearly hired servant. You see that right there? Do you people that? A hired servant. Sakir. Sakir. Sakir in the Hebrew is a hired servant. Right? The context here is a hired servant. Like, like for example, when my brother has an animal. I say, yo, I need your, your ox to plow my land. My ox died or whatnot like that. Or I have one ox. I don't want to just overwork this one ox. So can I use your ox? And he said, okay, use my ox, but you got to pay me this much bale of um, wheat or, or corn or whatever else like that. Or this much shekels or silver, boom. Right? Or a person who is hired, a hireling, a hired laborer. Right? In some sense, it could be a hired mercenary. If I'm a prince, right, and I might not have enough troops to go against, you know, this neighboring, you know, a neighboring prince or kingdom, I might have to hire out, you know, some soldiers, right, to, to, to augment the soldiers that I have. Strong's definition brings us out sakir from the word sakar, sakar, to hire. To hire oneself out to earn wages. Sakar. Sakar. So the sakir is the person. Sakar is the verb. Right? Is the verb right here. Sakar. Right? To hire. Right? Or to pay a wage. So sakir, a man at wages by the day or the year. This is how it was done in ancient times and even in holy Judeo-Christian Ethiopia up to 1974-75 where I might hire somebody to work a day like I have, a, I have um, crops and I only have like say 20 servants plus my son and daughter and wife and, and close family but I have this big piece of land and I need to take the, the ripe crops from here so I may have to hire out as day laborers extra hands to help me so extra sakir or sakirin, right? Or I might have to hire somebody by the year, right? That's a hired person, a hired man, a hired servant, or a hireling. So it says, as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him. And the other shall not rule. You notice a familiar a chorus line right here in HaTorah? In John's direction, instruction in the Torah, it says, And the other shall not rule with rigor, the same word, rigor, the perek, ferek, over him in thy sight. That means that if my neighbor, my brother over here, has servants and I see him dealing with them with rigor, right? We're not to tolerate that. That means there's a communal, a community responsibility. How dare you treat, you know, this person like, like they're a beast, like they're an animal. See, that's what the white man did. There was nobody to tell him how dare him. He was like a, you know, like a child that never got any instruction. He just did whatever he wanted to do. I mean, after all, one white man sent the other white man over here with a piece of paper called a charter. He got over here and recognized how rich the country was. And then he talked about being a slave because he had to pay taxes to the people who gave him the right to come over here. Talk about ingratitude. All right. Here, here, here. This was a part of it. 
one more area. I know we've been a little bit longer in this one, but it is, it is needful. It is necessary. All right. Before we go on to the next one, let us do this right here. All right. So we, all right. So right here, here, here. Just want to switch this up right here and get to my next set of exhibits right here. And let's go over here and let's go to Etim Online. Let's see if we can just go through this at a lively pace. Slave or Slav. The proper pronunciation of this is Slava. Slava. And they say, well, you know, no, actually Slav is just, just without the E. You know, they play these games on us, y'all. They play these games. Read some old English writing. They write the word book, right? Book. You see how it sounds? Book. And they write it B-O-O-K-E. Were those people back then, the classical English writers, were they illiterate? No, a lot of them actually were black. But anyway, you know, and because we would write things the way it sounds. You know what I mean? But they wrote the word book with a K at the end. Right? So Slav. Right? Late 13th century. 13th century is roughly the 1200s. Any year from 1200 to 1299. A person who is in the chattel or property of another. That means, and, and listen, I, I try to speak uh, good Canaanite in the sense of good, uh, some people say Caucasian or good white people speak, right? A person who is in the chattel is speak, speaking about a person like black people who is treated as animals and therefore property of another to be treated as not like, like, for example, I have an employee. The employee, in a sense, the employees belong to me. Not that everything about them belongs to me, but they are in my employ. So if anything happens to them, in some sense, I'm responsible for them. But here, the Slav was a person who was treated as an animal and in the property of another, namely the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, as an animal. From old French, esclave, is that esclave? I gotta ask some of my French speakers. Esclave. I know some of you'll say, wait, he speaks this Afro Shemitic, but not French. Yeah, the European language is beside English. I don't know, maybe there was a little mental. I'm I'm opening up my brothers and sisters help tutor me, right? Esclave, right? 13th century. From medieval Latin, sclavus, sclavus, slavus, slavus, sclavus, slave. Source also of Italian Schiavo, 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 French Esclave, Spanish Esclavo. Originally, you see what it's originally? Originally Slav, Slav, you know Slav, you know, you know Slav, like Slavic, like Slavonia, Yugoslavia. So used in this secondary sense because of the many Slavs sold into slavery by conquering people. Now, stop for a moment. These white people were reading the King James Version of the Bible, another version that was translated, right? And as we told you, slave only appears two times, once in the old, once in the new, and both of those places in the KJV, they're in error. The first place in Isaiah is italicized. It's not there in the, in the Hebrew. It's not there in the Amharic. It's not there in any of the original languages. It's not there even in the Koine Greek. And then in Revelation, where it talks about the merchandise of Babylon, and it says slaves, right? Slaves, right? No, no, no. There the word means bodies. I think I said earlier souls. It means bodies. In Revelation, I think it's Revelation 18, if we're correct. I think it means bodies, bodies, right? Bodies, right? So used in a secondary sense because many Slavs. So how in the world, remember Slavic countries are in Eastern Europe. How in the world that people in Western Europe on the island of Britain coming over here to America and even in Britain itself would then call people slaves? And then try to give a biblical justification when the biblical justification is servant and even bond servant. And if you read what we just read in the Bible, they should have been informed by that. And even if they had black people in servitude, they should have treated them much better than they did. See the hypocrisy of the counterfeit Christianity? Here, let's go to this right here. Let's, so it says that the oldest written history of the Slavs can be shortly summarized. Myriads of slave hunts, 
See how they see how they play with this? Slav is capital S, slave hunts is lower S, lowercase s. And the enthrallment of entire peoples. The Slav was the most prized of human goods. It almost sounds like they are speaking about black people, even though we know they're speaking about white people. See, there's something deep here. We don't have time to get into it. But it's almost like I, I, I'm going to get you back. Slavery, 400 years, like we're going to get you back. And the tell is them calling us Slavs. With increased strength outside his marshy land of origin, hardened to the utmost against all privation, industrial, industrious, content with little good humored and cheerful, he filled the slave markets of Europe, Asia, and Africa. Now, here I got to give you this, that this is speaking about a earlier time when white peoples were brought into servitude to black people. You, you probably have heard about how it said that, that black people civilized Europe. You might have heard from different, you know, different um, um, perspectives and like Nation of Islam, they have a version of it. The different ones have different versions of it. There's some truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that, actually. It must be remembered that for every Slavonic slave, Slavonic slave, you get that right there? <laughs> They're playing games with us. If you just read that and don't notice the irony, then they put you under their spell. The spell of Leviathan, right? Or something like that, right? Slavia, under, under the spell of Slaviathan, right? Who reached his destination, at least 10 succumbed to inhuman treatment during transport and to the heat of the climate. Now, isn't this interesting what we're reading about the short summary of the Slavs? It seems as though they repeated what happened according to their summary and history of the Slav. They repeated this against black people. Because if you understand that Europe at one time was ruled by melanated people, I can't say they were Africans because that was not the term for the continent called Ethiopia at the time, but they were black people. Even they were called Ethiopian people, right? Then later on, they were called Moors, even if they were not Islamic Moors, right? Indeed, Ibrahim, the 10th century himself, in all probability a slave dealer, says, quote, And the Slavs cannot travel to Lombardy on account of the heat, which is fatal to them. So you know we're not talking about black folk, right? Ibrahim, from the 10th century, they say himself, in all probability, a Slav dealer, he says, and the Slavs cannot travel to Lombardy on account of the heat, which is fatal to them, end quote, quote, end quote. Hence their high price. You ever see some of those pictures that they have of these like recreation pictures of like the Moors or ones they call the Moors, right? You ever see that they always have like these black skinned men, black men, and then they have these like blonde and very pale looking women, like like whole harem of them. That is what it's remember Othello? Remember Othello? Othello? He was in love with Desdemona, her pearly white skin and everything. Yeah. See, there's a lot of truth there. Right? But see, they put it in our face and we don't even see the connections. We don't get the understanding. Hopefully here you get the understanding the inner standing and come to that overstanding and the overcoming look a bit more right here because we're already kind of beyond our time it goes into the arabian geographica geographer of the ninth century that's like 800 800 something right it tells us how the 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 magyars in the potus steep dominated all the slavs dwelling near them the Magyars made raids upon the Slav and took their prisoners along the coast of Kirk, where the Byzantines came to meet them and gave Greek brocades and such wares in exchange for the prisoners. This is from the Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 2, from 1913. Right? So, meaning, one who has lost the power of resistance to some habit or vice. So here they're saying that Slav or slave can mean one who has lost the power of resistance to some 
habit or vice. This is from 1550s. It's applied to devices from 1904, especially those which are controlled by others. Compare the slave jib in sailing, similarly of locomotives, flash bulbs, amplifiers. Slave driver, this phrase slave driver is attested from 1807. Extended sense of cruel and exacting taskmaster is by 1854. Slave state, Slav state in U.S. history, United States history, United Slaves history is, United Slavs history is from 1812. Slave trade is attested from 1734. Now what they mean by this long and short of it is when they can find this in prior writing in documents, receipts, so to speak. It is absurd to bring back a runaway Slav. If a Slav can survive without a master, is it not awful to submit, to admit that the master cannot live without the Slav? Wow. Let me just read that one more time. It is absurd to bring back a runaway slave. If a slave can survive without a master, is it not awful to admit that the master cannot live without the slave? Question mark. Boom. Boom. That explains so much of what went on with our people over here in the Americas and the Caribbean, doesn't it? Diogenes, Diogenes, Fragment 6, translation by Guy Davenport. Right? One more, one more, right? Old English, well, well. That's probably like that, really old English, well, wheel, wheel, right? Britain, Britain, also began to be used in the sense of serf slave. Uh-oh, let me tell you about how black people rule Britain. Britain also began to be used in the sense of serf, slave. Circa 850, 850 the year, the year that was 850. And in the Sanskrit, dasa, which can mean slave, apparently is connected with dasyu, pre-Aryan, right, inhabitant of India. Gross Dictionary 1785 has under Negro, with a E, N-E-G-R-O-E, -E, quote, a black amor, a black amor, figuratively used for a slav or slave without regard to race uh-oh without regard to what without regard to race uh-oh see one time it was so but this is what they did over 400 years in their so-called white supremacy they made it apply strictly to black israelite people my our people more common Old English words for slave were, were P.O., P.O., or P.O.ian, to serve, or Proel, see Thral. The Slavic words for slave, Russian Rob, Serbo-Croatian Robe, Old Church Slavonic Rabu, hmm, are from Old Slavic, bring a whole new sense when we say our Black Lord and Savior, Adoneno, Robeno, our rabbi, right? Rabu, right? Are from Old Slavonic or Slavic Orbu, from the PIE root Orbe, right? Also source for orphan. Mm. The ground sense of which seems to be, quote, thing that changes allegiance, end quote. In the case of the slave, from himself to his master, the Slavic word is also the source of robot, 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 robot. The Slavic word is also used, is also, is also the source of robot. Ain't that something? So Slav, Slav had to do with a group of people. Slav, right? Because the real fact of the matter is, that black peoples, right, or melanated peoples had taken non-melanated peoples into a form of um, servitude, 
right? And see, we can even look at the Bible. The Bible even kind of gives a context to it, a separation between our peoples, right? B'nai Yisrael and those who, who worship the Elohim of Yisrael and other peoples who we might encounter and fight and conquer and they would be our servants. And they would receive a wage and they could become a part of our society. They would be nationalized in that sense. The only thing different between them and a born a hereditary Israelite is land rights. Right? And see, when we start to study these things, we can see like almost they did certain things. It was almost like as a get back. A lot of things just don't make sense. Why do they treat black people like this? There's something else going on. There's some backstory. But for them to say, well, y'all did this to me. Y'all did this to us. For the white people to say that we did something in their imagination, right, like this to them, right? We did civilize them, black peoples. I say black peoples as a general word. Not African because the term African was not applied to the whole continent at the time. So we can't use reverse engineering like what we say today with ancient times. That is bad um, scholarship. Right? That's out of context. Well, here's a couple of the, what we're going to leave you with a couple of the words right here. Right? Let's go over here. You can see some of this right here coming down right here. Right? Slav, slave. So from, from a group of people, Slavonini, like Slavonic, old church Slavonic, Slav. Right? And they remember, remember this, remember this right here. When we go to some of those Eastern European, Russian Orthodox church, when we get into some of those churches and we see some of the icon, notice that all the old icons are black. Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh, Jesus is black. Mary is black. The apostles are black. All of them are black. Black, black, black. Think about what we're saying here. And the Slavs at that time were certain European or white, in, in, in Eastern European, um, Indo-European, Canaanitish peoples. And then when they began to, when we say, take on, we could say the Judeo-Christian value, right? They basically became more civilized. Right, except it almost go back to what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says: Can you civilize the devil? Not nowadays, <laughs> right? You know, because what would happen to us after that period of time that would lead to what happened to us in these latter days. Once again, I'm gonna leave some of this on the screen just for a quick moment, so ones can pause it and study it or take screenshots of it. Right? Right here, slave, slav, connotation, the connotation, not the etymology, the connotation, like the con game. One bound in servitude to a person, household as an instrument of labor. One who is submissive or subject to a specified person or influence. The denotation, the denotation, right? A slav in the ninth century, that's the 800s. Remember, 850 is the ninth century. The Slavs, who were the Slavs? They were inhabitants of Eastern Europe. See, at the time the Slavs were inhabitants of Eastern Europe, black people predominantly were ruling main, mainland Europe. How do we know this? We know this from books like um, J.A. Rogers, Nature Knows No Color Line, and where he shows all the coat of arms that had, had black heads, Negro head, Moor head, Ethiopian heads. You know, it depends on who you're reading, who want to characterize it. But um, J.A. Rogers does a good job in documenting what you hear loosely in the black conscious community nowadays. If you want to get the truth, get that particular book, Nature Knows No Color Line, J.A. Rogers. He's the one that breaks down a lot of the primary information you get to see kind of loose in the caboose circulated on social media nowadays. The Slavs, inhabitants of Eastern Europe, were said to be an easy conquest because they did not fight aggressively. From the 5th to the 9th century, Slavs were conquered by the Celts, the Greeks, the Romans, the Turks, and Moors, and forced to labor as part of their subjection. They should say the Ethiopians too. When we said Ethiopians is what black people were called in Europe before they were called Moors. Facts. Se semantic shift. Semantic shift is where they play the word game. They, they shift the goalposts. Expanded. The definition expanded from a particular ethnic group 
to a person subjugated and forced into servitude. This is what happened to black and brown people in the Americas and the Caribbean. It is a semantic shift. At one time it applied right, to, to we could say, Indo-European, Canaanitish, whitish peoples, Slavic peoples of Eastern Europe, right? And then they flipped it and used it to the Israelites, the lost sheep, the black people, right, over here in the Americas and the Caribbean, right? The root of the word slave, the modern word for slave come from Slav. During the Middle Ages, most slaves in Europe and the Islamic world were people from Slavic Eastern Europe. Hmm. It was only in the 15th century. Now notice, notice this. Let me say this. Only in the 15th century. Now what happened in the 15th century? This is where the 400 year thing for us began. This is where the flip mode came. That slavery, slavery became linked with people from sub-Saharan Africa. Why? Because the people in the Sahara and in North Africa were genetically linked with the people in Indo, the Indo-European, Eastern Europe. The white man is a Canaanite. I, I'll point it out and we'll get into that a little bit more so. Right? So then it became linked with we peoples. So now people think that, oh, black people were the slaves, the only slaves and the slaves. But actually, white people were the original Slavs, slavery. Now, this is something on Black Friday, how it, you know, it was from like slave traders that would sell slaves for a discount to assist the plantation owners with more helpers for the upcoming winter, right? Cutting and stacking firewood, wood winter proofing and so forth and so on. We're going to like to get into a whole reason, man on that right there, 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 Black Friday, original Black Friday sale, right, Black Friday sale, but here on the word, is this slave, sir, uh, well, this is, this is, stop calling someone sir, right, sir, right, S slave I remain, some people say that sir has to do with slave I remain, very interesting, I'll leave that there for once to pause it and read it, Right, I'll leave this here for a moment for you to pause it and read it. Right, and um, then they marched people from East Africa to West Africa to the slave ports. Just to point that out there, because they make you think that all the slaves were just taken. Just no, it was they was running all over the place in Africa, wherever they could. And sometimes they marched people from East Africa to West Africa. Many died, but they still did that. Right? Others went into, you could say, Asia and, and other parts of the world. As you can see right here, like in East Africa, you see the East Africa, the Indian Ocean. They say African or Ethiopian enslavement trade. This is what His Majesty is speaking about, right? What was happening over here, right? That's why he mentions um, the Muslims and the Aramawian, who the translator called pagans. Right? Or the people who don't have our morals, mores, the Torah, basically. Right? Okay, so right here, 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 we're summing up right here with this. Right? With this, got to get away. Get away from the slavery. Right? By first of all, recognizing. This I thought was interesting right here. Well, and this, some people don't like Thomas so well. They say he's Uncle Tom, whatever, because he doesn't get into that. Um, the over-exaggerated pseudo-black consciousness, but some things he says is very interesting. I'll sum up here. More, more whites were brought as slaves to North America than blacks brought as slaves to the United States or to 13 colonies from which it was formed. White slaves were still being bought and sold in the Ottoman Empire decades after blacks were freed in the United States. There's a very interesting point that he's making there. Now, some may not want that because a lot of facts have been over-exaggerated, you know, but that's a very interesting point there. Don't want to just leave off on this. So, so we're no longer Slavs or Slav or Slave. Yes, the King of Kings, Nagusa Nagesk, and Amal Hala Selassie. Yes, Emperor Selassie abolished slavery in Ethiopia. And no, he did not have Slavs. He did not have Slavs. 
but as he says right here, 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 right, there were many people in each province who were doing a day's work, being taken in service for a wage, right? There were ones who worked for a wage. Chapter 14 of the autobiography, there's more details here that speaks of even the emperors, the king of kings, right, before his match, like Teudros and others. Teudros, he reigned in Ethiopia from like 1845, roughly to like 1906. Um, and right here, 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 he had promulgated decrees against the sale and purchase of slaves in Ethiopia. And for Teudros, he was very much against the Mohammedan, the Ottoman Turkish influence, because the Ottoman Turks, who are Indo-European people, right? Um, they, they had enslaved a lot of black people and a lot of Ethiopians had, had stolen children and stolen different ones. And there was even a enslavement of self-professed Beta Israel or Israelites from Ethiopia as well, did you know, in history, right? And so many of the Ethiopian um, kings and kingdoms fought against it, right? So it was just basic hypocrisy what the Italians during the time of um, um, Benito Mussolini was seeking to say against his majesty and those who continued to promulgate this lie that his majesty had slaves and didn't abolish slavery. They are liars, they are perjurers, they are no good. Either they're very ignorant, but if they know what they're doing, and you show them the evidence and they continue, then you should know, you know what sort of degenerate, deprived individual you're dealing with that prefers to circulate lies right, against those of our people who have diligently vigorously fought against, right? The slave trade that was being fought against in Ethiopia was protecting the border against like white folks, of course, but they didn't really try it so much beside the Italians and so-called Mohammedan and Arab and pseudo-Moors and the rest of them who were trying to do that. And the penalty for the slave trade was biblical, right? In Ethiopia, it was death, as the Bible says. So, with that right there, I am Ross Iadonis Tafari, L-O-J, Society, the Lion of Judah Society, is yard in here. Check out the description, can link with I and I, right, and the official Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated as well. Check the links, right, right here, here, here. So, yes, His Majesty abolished slavery, slavery, the Slav trade in Ethiopia under the penalty of death. And let me just make this point. People say, well, some of it's still going on today. Well, yes, but you know, the bad thing that happens, it's like, it's like De Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 28, verse 68, where it says, and you will be sold, right? You know, you will be sold, right? Actually, if you read the Hebrew, you will sell one another. Sometimes people even do things to their own people for monetary gain. So there is this kind of um, um, fake employment that be going on where some Ethiopians have been sent forward into some of the Mohammedan and Arab countries like Saudi and other places by unscrupulous business practices and find themselves in service with rigor, harsh rigor, harsh bondage that does go on to this day. Right, but it's not a policy, right, and it's not approved of, right, by we, the Ethiopian Hebrews, you know, of the royal order of His Imperial Majesty, or any of those of us of the truth. Just to point that out right there. That's a whole other subject matter, but there is the same dehumanization of human beings, and it is very um, despicable and sad when sometimes we find that. It is our own people. There's a, there's a Torah area in the Torah where it says, like, if a Hebrew, right, an Israelite it sells another Israelite or, or seeks to sell another Israelite, and if the person is found in their hand, they would be put to death. And this is what 
His Majesty, the conquering line, the tribe of Judah, the root of David, upon the throne of great King David, right? Authorized, right? Should be and was the punishment for such practices, which is strictly divine, strictly biblical, and right and accurate. Shalom, Chavarim. Shalom.